Now let's get started by introducing my esteemed colleagues. Let me briefly share some background in each of the presenters you will hear from today. First, we have Pam Hines. Professor Hines is an associate professor in the Management Science and Engineering and co-director of the Center for Work, Technology, and Organization at Stanford. Her research and teaching leverage their social sciences, organizational behavior in particular, to understand the effects of technology on groups and teams and organizations. Pamela is probably most known for her research on international distributed work teams, and she is increasingly interested in culture. She just embarked upon a study of how design practices and design thinking vary in different regions around the world. Pamela believes that cultural context shapes the practices that are possible and appropriate in different settings and that are honoring these differences is key to innovation. She is the co-editor with Sarah Kiesler of the book Distributed Work. Next, I'd like to introduce Michael Berry. Michael is a consulting assistant professor in the mechanical engineering department at Stanford University, teaching need finding and cross-cultural design. Also a guest lecturer at the Harvard School of Business and at the University of California Haas School of Business. Michael teaches the nation's top students how to connect innovation to new understandings of customers. A founder of Point Forward, Michael has over two decades of experience providing strategic innovation at the critical early stages of the product development process. With a wide range of expertise from engineering to design to cultural studies, he has restructured research and innovation processes, provided strategic project management, and designed over 80 products from mainframes to disposable diapers. Now I'd like to turn it over to Michael to get us started today. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, let's move on to our first slide. Here we are. Um, culture and design thinking is kind of the title today. And we have kind of a question. Um, why focus on culture? Why is that going to be of importance to you guys? Well, in our experience, um, a lot of Western companies uh, see developing and emerging markets as absolutely intoxicating. Just a small fraction of these new consumers just make heads spin. So what, in our experience, often happens? Um, well, the entrepreneurs and marketers will visit, say, for example, Beijing or Shanghai for a week, and they'll see gorgeous modern cities. They'll check into a fancy hotel and run some focus groups relative to whatever product they've got, get some answers, and then launch into all of China. Well, as you might guess, things often don't work out as they expect. Um, uh, simply hoping that you're going to get this huge group and that your product designed here is going to fit um, often isn't what happens. And what we see is China, like most emerging markets, has very complex cultures and they are transitioning at very fast rates. We see incredible change going on. Uh, some of that change is along known patterns. Other times that change is, is very, very different than what we've seen before. And providing any kind of product or service to these millions, uh, we believe requires a uh, different kind of knowledge. So uh, we teach, uh, and Stanford is certainly known for this thing called design thinking, and at the core of satisfying and, and being having successful products is understanding people's needs. But there are different kinds of needs and how they're expressed. There are those explicit needs that people can talk about readily, and then there are the ones that we feel are very important tied to innovation, and that's the implicit needs. Um, we have what we refer to as a cultural iceberg. Uh, and with that cultural iceberg, a lot of the behaviors and, and responses to products and services are very much above the surface. We can see them. We can record them. We have, uh, 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 we can gather kind of straightforward empirical data. And then there are the things below the surface. This is the assumptions and values that people have a hard time directly talking about. And as you might guess, as you get into different cultures, these things vary dramatically and can have a huge impact on the kind of products that we offer. So 
Just to summarize, the explicit needs are the needs we can readily observe and discuss. Um, now, the fact that you're staying in a four-star hotel may not mean you're even seeing what's really important. And then there are the implicit needs. And these are the things that even people within the culture are not necessarily aware of, but we look at ways to get at them. Um, Pam offers a really nice definition of culture, and she's going to talk a little later. But Pam describes culture as a fuzzy set of attitudes, beliefs, behavioral norms, uh, the basic assumptions and values that are shared by a group of people. We find in many ways that culture is um, how people solve problems. Uh, and when they start to think and frame problems differently, we may be seeing a different culture. What's important is that these shared assumptions um, influence each member's behavior and are shared between that group. We're seeing not just the nature of the behavior, but the meaning people give their behavior. This is what makes up culture. And at the end of the day, this is what we try to understand. And there's lots of anthropologists, both academic and applied, who have been working on this. Um, and I think this idea that culture fundamentally constitutes who we are. Um, what people do, yes, we have sort of personal schemas and things that drive what we do, but yes, I, we have found that the largest determiner of what makes us do what we do and think the way we think is culture. And this is why we want to understand it. Uh, people share their thoughts with people around them. And what's critical is these thoughts are both shared and public. We can get at them. And when we start to find cultural stories, we find they're shared across that culture. Um, as I said, it's kind of what we study. I, I want to give you, though, a kind of cautionary note, and it's that uh, this is some work that Hazel Marcus has done. Uh, Americans have a really tough time understanding uh, this idea of difference. Um, and she's done a lot of testing. So, for example, uh, she showed a group of uh, Japanese students, Japanese and Chinese college students' patterns, and American students' patterns. And what's interesting is the American students consistently picked the set of patterns on the left, Asian students the patterns on the right. And it was a sense of both the pattern on the left represented something that was more interesting, a little more dynamic, reflective of what a good pattern is. Pattern on the right suggested another set of norms. Um, so for Americans, uh, we often see that and believe that cultures differ. Um, and essentially, we see cultures as Americans with people who speak different languages. We'd like to believe, while everybody's kind of different individually, we're still all the same, right? It's that, that idea of equality, and the only difference is language. And what we've seen is that the differences are, are, are fundamentally um, uh, uh, can be very important. So on the one hand, and looking at this graph, we're looking at sort of cultural attributes versus ideas of normalcy, two bell curves. And if you compare two cultures, Asia and the U.S., pretty much things are the same. But then there are on the outsides of those curves what we call kind of cultural slivers. These are the issues that are somewhat different. Sometimes it's meaning, sometimes it's behavior. Uh, depending on the product or service you're building, sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. So let me give you an example. This is some work, again, from Hazel, and it was understanding Japanese baseball. Um, and here are two sporting activities that, between our two countries, are almost exactly the same. Uh, and what's interesting, though, is when our ball players go to Japan, they assume the rules are the same, outfits are the same, what could be different. And uh, all of a sudden, a baseball player, the team that he's on will be two, three runs ahead, and he will hit a home run. And as he circles the bases, the crowd is silent. Everyone is kind of upset and disturbed with what he's just done. At home, he'd be expecting cheers. What's going on? Uh, and for our players, it's discovering that 
Uh, in America, it's very much an individualistic job, right? And success is what matters. Beating the hell out of the other guy, that's, you know, showing how good you are. That's what's most important. And in Japan, baseball is very much a collective way of life. It's symbolic of that. It's more than just kind of physical and mental ability. It also speaks to a kind of social and moral test. And when you sort of humiliate your opponent, you've done a disservice to the larger culture. And as I said, this is a subtle difference. And for our players, they may never get in that Japanese mindset, but they can begin to learn the rules and things that will help them fit in. And that's, in essence, what we want to do for you guys. So I want to let Pam talk about some strategies. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the different strategies that have been used over the centuries and decades for designing markets that span one country's region or national boundary. Um, these include translation, localization, internationalization, and um, more recently, adaptive and adaptable systems. So I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail. So translation has been used for centuries as a means to enable trade across language barriers. Um, even today, translation is widely used for goods such as clothing and toys where the identical product is going to be sold in different language markets. Um, translation includes more than just translating the, the words in the language. It includes spelling variants in British versus American English, um, punctuation, writing direction, um, and so forth. So it's everything having to do with the uh, language and communication. Um, translation um, can be and has been very effective for a variety of products and services, and it's probably, in fact, a necessary component of just about any strategy for introducing a global product or service but it tends not to be adequate in today's global markets. Facebook, for example, um, has historically taken a largely translation approach um, in Japan. So, for example, translating Facebook uh, without much in the way of any kind of localization efforts. Mixi, in contrast, is a social networking site uh, made by the Japanese for the Japanese. Um, it looks very similar, uh, works very uh, similarly in a lot of ways, but newcomers can only join by invitation, uh, which provides the degree of privacy and safety that users feel they need in Japan in order to divulge their identities online. Communication on the site is centered on the Nikki or diary, a concept that's deeply seated uh, in the Japanese psyche. Um, and this has resulted in very different levels of adoption um, for uh, Facebook versus Mixi. Reports are varied, but one source indicates that Mixi had about 12 million unique users in June 2007 and June 2008, whereas Facebook had about 172,000 uh, in um, June 2007 and 538,000 in June 2008, uh, so during that same time period. Um, indications are also that users of Mixi are more engaged um, than they are in Facebook. So, for example, they spend more time, they contribute more, and so forth. So it just is a more enriching, more fulfilling experience uh, for the Japanese to use the product that was actually designed um, in a way that's really resonant uh, with their culture. So in this day and age, uh, translation um, usually just is not an adequate strategy. Um, users are increasingly demanding more. So the second strategy that I'll talk about is localization. This has also been around uh, a long time. Uh, localization is basically the process of adapting, and oftentimes this is used, for example, with software, um, the product or service for a specific region by adding locale-specific components. So McDonald's is one of my uh, favorite examples, um, they really do remain largely the same across cultures. Um, you know, people uh, can walk into any McDonald's around the world and recognize that they're, in fact, um, in a McDonald's. But they're also noted for uh, their um, outstanding efforts at localization. 
They have cafes throughout Europe, uh, extensive vegetarian selections in India, as well as the Maharaja Mac that has two all-lamb patties, uh, the Mac Falafel in Egypt that served on a pita, a green tea and samurai pork burger in Thailand, and so on and so forth. So uh, just wonderful um, localization efforts that indicate um, a sense of what it is that's needed in those environments. And then on top of that, of course, they've also localized their advertising, their language, and so forth. So a pretty complete strategy. Language localization uh, includes translation as well as a host of other um, elements based on the local context. Uh, translation and localization have been the bread and butter of multinationals for decades. Um, but it's a relatively narrow context, having little to do with a, a real deep understanding of the culture. Um, more recent focus has really shifted to internationalization. So internationalization strategies are focused on making the product work anywhere. So the hope is that a product can work across uh, cultural barriers, across language barriers, without really the need uh, for localization. And the motivation here is to make just one product and be able to get the economies of scale. Um, so car manufacturers, uh, for, exa uh, for exa example, General Motors, has really made a push to do that with cars. Uh, the hope is to have uh, one line that can produce a line of cars, uh, produce a particular uh, vehicle that can then be set, uh, sold anywhere around the world. Uh, so, for example, with seat belts, um, thinking about how to make seat belts, they basically uh, design seat belts for the toughest regulatory environment and then assume that that seat belt configuration will work anywhere in the world. Uh, the iPhone is another example. Um, it has very little localization with the expectation um, when it was introduced that there would be 3G or 4G networks um, in their major markets around the world and that the cool factor of the iPhone uh, would sell around the globe. Um, this assumption is that products can be made that can really skirt the cultural or language differences, um, and they often rely on the value of the culture that was embedded in the product. Uh, so, for example, French wine, Nike running shoes, and so forth. In, in some sense, in buying these uh, products that are um, international, they're also reflecting, um, sort of buying into um, an American culture, a French culture, a Japanese culture, um, wherever that product uh, was designed and and, and kind of what it, what it symbolizes. Uh, but mostly, um, I would argue that this is a myth. Um, even with the iPhone, there are significant issues um, with its fit, for example, in China, in part due to cost, uh, Wi-Fi wi -Fi connectivity um, is not um, as pervasive uh, across China, um, lack of iTunes availability and penetration and so forth uh, made it a fairly tough uh, sell, uh, particularly um, early on in China. Um, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about adaptive and adaptable systems. Uh, these are systems that um, are increasingly being built to learn about uh, users' behavior and the environment in which they're operating, and then the systems themselves um, adjust accordingly. So they're really responding to the needs that are expressed by users through their behavior in interacting with these systems. Um, so what's common across all of these approaches? And we've got a, a poll for you here. Okay, so what we're asking here is what's common across all these approaches. Uh, one is, you know, they don't lead to innovative products and services. The blue is they assume product stability. Number three, yellow, they don't change the underlying metaphor um, of the product. Uh, the green is that they assume a very developed world-centric approach. Um, and five, the purple, they all end in I-O-N. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to go forward here. Um, one of the assumptions, um, actually, 
all of the answers uh, were correct except the last one because adaptive and adaptive syst um, um, systems doesn't end in ION. But the rest are uh, correct. Um, all, one of the assumptions in all of these strategies, including translation, localization, internationalization, and adaptation, um, oh, they do all end in ION. Well, there you go. Depends on how you read it. Um, <laughs> is that uh, the product is stable. In other words, there's a foundation on which the skins of the product is actually changed, um, but those changes tend to be largely cosmetic, um, not really changing the underlying metaphor. And that means that the products may be acceptable for use in another culture, but they don't necessarily fit well into those cultures. They don't really resonate with uh, the needs of the people in those cultures. Hence, the lack of success of Facebook and other U.S. products in China uh, that made surface-level changes rather than really understanding deeply the underlying needs um, in those markets and of those people. Um, we just need to look, for example, at the successes of Baidu um, as a search engine um, in China and Alibaba, especially Taobao, which is touted as the eBay of China, to see the effects of having products that are truly sensitive to uh, these local needs. I like to think of it as, you know, it's like wearing a shoe that sort of fits, but it gives you blisters. You know, it works. It's something that you can walk around in, but if there's a shoe available that doesn't give you blisters, you're immediately going to drop the first pair and move to the other. Um, according to a study that was done by Deloitte uh, a few years ago, Fewer than 50% of companies competing in emerging markets <clears throat> excuse me, have achieved their goals, largely because their products are unsuccessful with significant segments of the market. <clears throat> and that's really what we're talking about here, is how do you get to those significant segments of the market um, in those emerging, um, those emerging environments? Of course, a lot of products and services are very successful this way, and they have been over many, many years. But the global market is changing. I think there's less um, tolerance for shoes that cause blisters. Um, and we believe that many products and services can be much more successful than they are today uh, by thinking more deeply about um, these underlying needs. So we advocate global design, which is thinking about all products and services being located somewhere located in some cultural environment, in some language context, in some um, uh, geographic region, and honoring the culture and the context of that region in thinking through um, what the underlying metaphor will be um, for that product. Um, in the course, we'll talk in uh, much more detail about uh, the framework that you see here. Um, it advocates a process of understand, understanding needs through observation, developing frameworks, um, creating imperatives, and then coming up with solutions that meet those underlying needs. By doing this, we can determine the real underlying needs of a given culture or region and have some hope of actually coming up with a solution that's completely different um, and ideally suited uh, for a targeted region. And we believe that this is where the true innovation um, and where design thinking comes in. So Michael is now going to talk to you about a case study that exemplifies um, the ideas that we've talked about so far. Okay. Thank you, Pam. And, and by the way, this kind of reflects also our sort of structure within the class. I think we are certainly interested in theory but we uh, really are concerned with practice and both in having you engage and through case studies. So we'll give you just a little case study to kind of give you a sense for how this works. And it's a case study uh, about Wrigley. And Wrigley sells different kinds of gum and confection products around the world. And uh, we were asked to understand um, breath and how they could create breath products that would better fit the needs of many, many different countries. Now, they started out with uh, an internationalization approach. They wanted to have a single product, a single set of brands, 
single packaging that would go everywhere. And that was kind of their starting point. Um, kind of worked until they hit China. And um, sales in China, and this is all um, late 90s, all in the start to 2000, had been pretty flat. Uh, in fact, they had had one disaster where um, a package, uh, which essentially was a resealable package, plastic package of gum pellets, which had done very well in the U.S. and the U.K., was introduced into China, and everyone saw it. It was modern and nice. Uh, it simply didn't move. The, the Chinese found it kind of awful, much, much to just the dismay of Wrigley, who this was kind of a top-selling product. What's wrong? It isn't fitting. So um, we looked at lots and lots of countries around the world and um, talked to people about breath. Uh, and one would assume that's sort of a challenging topic because um, the idea was, well, uh, and, and this was, again, another assumption within the company that, well, bad breath is simply the absence of good breath, so it's really about particulates, it's about um, uh, cleaning, it's very akin to uh, brushing teeth, and we actually found that's not true. Um, in the next slide, uh, here are some relationships of how people think about breath around the world, and we're going to start with the U.S., and uh, we've divided people consistently talk about breath in terms of removal. As I said, there's particulates and malodor, and they've got to get rid of it. And then there's this thing called enhancement. And that's actually a little more complicated. And in the U.S., what we find is most people think in terms of removal um, and very little sense of enhancement. Um, now, you have to remember Wrigley is a U.S. company based in Chicago, Wrigley Stadium. And again, their view was, well, everyone must think roughly the same way. Well, as we went through the world, um, UK, a little different. Uh, the overall sort of intensity of feelings are different, but a lot more sense of enhancement. Um, and we'll, I'll talk to you a little more about what we mean by enhancement. In Germany, the enhancement, in fact, is the most important aspect. People talk much more about good breath, their ability to link it to grooming, how they feel. That's what's really at issue. Uh, last one, China. So two things. One, uh, good breath, the enhancement side was more important. But overall, uh, the sense of this idea of breath was kind of a mystery. Um, there was simply, well, good breath, which is how your mouth should be all the time. And then the idea of bad breath was something that existed only if you were sick or really had serious hygiene problems and that people simply didn't have bad breath. It just wasn't something that was out there. Uh, so uh, we then, and, and, and this sort of gives you a glimpse, this diagram shows all the individual need states um, within the uh, removal and enhancement side. And we have actually started to take apart, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but we took apart what those individual need states were for each country. Um, it turns out China probably had the most complex set of needs uh, across all the need states of any of the countries, despite the fact that the overall interest was pretty low. So uh, Wrigley started to have a sense that maybe we needed to understand China better. Maybe if we understood these needs, uh, we might be able to affect behavior. So we went into... Um, uh, six major cities and four outlying areas, what are called sort of second and third tier cities, um, and did lots and lots of both interviews. Uh, these were people who were willing to let us hang out with them uh, uh, for half a day or so. We gave them homework assignments where we asked people to keep diaries of what they did. Uh, we also did things like displacement where we actually had people change what they did for a period of time. If they were uh, gum chewers, we'd ask them to use mints. We'd ask them to keep fresh breath uh, not using gum. Or if they weren't gum chewers before, only do it with gum. And we started to collect data from what we were seeing. Um, so a number of things came out. Uh, first one, and this has to do with some basic features. Um, that plastic resealable bag that I mentioned before, well, it turns out that one of the reasons it failed was in China, sharing is really, really important. 
And there's also a sense that uh, I may be sharing in a location that is like a department store, incredibly clean, as modern as anything we've seen. Or I could be sharing in an environment where there is uh, an open sewer and it's kind of not so nice. I had lots of interesting smells. Um, so notions of hygiene and how you share are really important. And the idea that I put my hand into a bag, take a part, I've contaminated the whole bag. And as Americans, we don't have that sensitivity. In China, very sensitive. There's also this notion of what's referred to as controlled sharing. In America, we will, and, and UK as well, we will hand over the pack of gum and say, help yourself. In China, there's a sense that I want to maintain control and give you the piece or pieces and that that sense of where it's coming from is always maintained. So we started to look at different kinds of physical packaging that would support these things. And it was actually almost serendipitously that we tried uh, a vitamin bottle. Um, and in many ways, a vitamin bottle isn't as effective as the individually wrapped pieces. But people responded to it extremely well. They loved the plastic snap. Uh, the plastic snap to people said, this guarantees freshness. Even though the pellets themselves, the tabs weren't individually wrapped. We also noticed, and this was as we let people play with this particular packaging, they did something really unique. In fact, we'd never seen it anywhere in the world. The teens figured this out first, that the lid, the snap plastic lid that had a living hinge, you could pop a single piece of gum into the lid and hand it to someone. Kids went nuts. Now, you had to develop a little skill in doing this, but uh, we discovered that this packaging had both some functional benefits but more importantly, had a lot of meaning that tied to sharing, that tied to freshness, and also had an interesting, um, uh, uh, it was a new sort of bit of language. As I flipped a pellet into the lid and handed it to you, it was a gesture that was both intimate and, and novel. So um, we introduced this package pretty early on. And it started doing really well. Well, we also did some other things. We connected this package with Double Mint, which had been a kind of old-fashioned brand in the U.S. And Double Mint, in fact, uh, wasn't a breath brand at all. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, and in fact, here's, here was a problem. Uh, the Chinese absolutely refused to call the product what Wrigley wanted them to call it. Uh, in China, Double Mint uh, was referred to as Double Arrow. They just wouldn't use the right name, darn them. Um, but this idea of double arrow actually had a lot of meaning to it. It spoke about change. It spoke about modernity. Um, in fact, the Chinese talked, and especially the kids, talked about different double arrow products, some of which Wrigley didn't even make yet. So we encouraged Wrigley to stop thinking in terms of internationalization and you already have this very powerful brand that will link to this idea of breath. Um, there's also another tricky thing with breath. And if you remember, I talked about in China, unlike here, uh, breath either meant something kind of normal or something really, really bad. Um, and you can't share something that's taking care of a really, really bad problem. If I'm sharing a product and it says to you, you have bad breath, I'm in a lot of trouble. So I needed to figure out how do I communicate the importance of this product, the quality of the product, but without flagging that you have stinky breath. So part of it came from a family of offerings that we started to look at different flavors, different modes, so that within the sharing we could tie it to people's choices. But more importantly um, was a brand and the double arrow needed to be linked to important piece of meaning unique to China. And uh, I want to show you an ad, and I'll explain to you. It was referred to as the, uh, the open door ad. And just to let you know, in China, uh, as I said, we were looking for a symbol, something that didn't directly say this deals with bad breath, but something that was a metaphor, a symbol of it that everybody would understand, but nobody would take offense at. So I want to share with you uh, an advertisement.
真的准备好了吗？绿箭口香糖，清新口气，让您充满自信，迈向成功。绿箭口香糖，清新口气，成功助力。Okay, so what did we just see? Um, well, one, this was. An enormously successful ad in China, and and how come? Well, one, it used the notion of sliding door of a doorway to talk about breath, not as something stinky or malodor, but it's about being allowed in. And doorways are very important in China.、Uh, the other thing that's very very important you'll notice in the ad is this is about business people. Most ads about breath deal with relationships and romance, and what we found is. Courtship relationships in China are first and foremost start with business. Romance comes later. So the idea that for lots of people,、uh, this well-groomed man wasn't being allowed in. Yeah, he could see through the door, but until he used the double arrow, and again the double arrow now signifying opening doors,、uh, and that we're not directly talking about breath, but we are talking about grooming.、Uh, You also have to remember this is a world where social、uh, lubrication is about cigarettes. So we're competing directly with cigarettes, which we're also seeing、uh, among a lot of our interviews. Families, teens, we're starting to question. This becomes an alternative to the cigarette as that door opener. So、uh, the good news: we figured out how to talk about Brad Breath without talking about it.、Uh, we linked. Double mint, which had been just a brand about confection, we now emphasize the part of the brand that in China was truly meaningful, that everybody was already pointing us to, which was the double arrow, and linked it to that opening door. And lastly, we tied it to a new plastic container, a plastic container that spoke of modernity, it spoke of、uh, freshness in a very different way, and it spoke about sharing all the components that, again. Tie to professional courtship relations. So the good news is, after the years of stagnation I talked about in 2006, sales in China increased to 13 percent. Excuse me, they increased 13 percent、uh, over what they had been. What that turns into is China now sells more gum than all the other countries in the world combined. So suddenly、um, the、uh, Executive team in China who had sort of been、um, kind of asking for help, being given sort of the dribs and drabs of Wrigley, have now suddenly kind of taken over and are leading the charge in terms of innovation of what's possible and how to think about gum. So with that, that is our case study for today and introduction to to cross cultural design. We would love to take any questions or comments. Great, thanks, Tim, Michael. So, I'd like to remind folks: please submit your questions, and I'm going to describe a little bit about how you can learn more about today's topics. And as soon as I'm finished, we're going to have them answer questions from the audience. So, I'd like to talk about a little bit about our Stanford Advanced Project Management Program. Here at Stanford, we're pleased to offer the Stanford Advanced Project Program for the past 11 years. With IP Solutions and in partnership with Professor Ray Levitt, we believe that the SAPM certificate is a unique offering because it blends the industry and practical experience from experts at IPS with the Stanford theory and research. This resulting in a truly rigorous and advanced program. Also, what we've tried to do in creating this program is offer this course in some flexible delivery options, so participants can either come to Stanford's campus in March, June. And/or September. Also, watch the courses online via streaming video anytime, and also through your company worksite through IP Solutions. They can create tailored workshops for cohorts of 20 or more. And as you see here for the Stanford Advanced Project Management Certificate Program, it was created for leaders and managers who want to improve their ability to convert strategy into action through project program and portfolio management, and that of their organizations and teams. So we take an organizational perspective in the curriculum that focuses on operating in a global context and improving productivity and profitability. 
And here you can see laid out on the slide that there are three required courses, Converting Strategy into Action, Mastering the Project Portfolio, and Leadership for Strategic Execution. And the program requires participants to complete a total of six courses, so we've included a number of electives that you can take, including this new course that we will be offering in June, Innovating Global Products and Services, sort of what our webinar was based off today. The calendar here shows the dates in March and June for our on-campus events with the core and elective sort of details as well as some pricing details. For June, we have an early registration date of May 1st, whereas if you sign up by May 1st, you can save about $250 per course. And as you can see that our innovating global products and services will be running from June 13th through 15th this year. With that, we would just like to take a moment to conduct a poll that we'd appreciate your feedback on. If you could just take a moment to indicate your level of interest in the SAPM certificate program, that would be great. We also are very excited that we often get um, current enrollees as well as alumni to the program who attend these webinars on a regular basis. So just letting you know, this way we can have folks, if you're interested in coming in March and June, who can help support any questions that you may have, or if you're interested in bringing the SAPM program to your company site as well. Um, also, if you have any questions about how our online courses work. Great. Thank you so much. Please make sure that we have um, some questions from the audience today that we can ask. Great. Okay. So here's a question. The product design did not change, however. The message to introduce it changed. The gum was still gum. I agree that the crafting of the message was important, but the design didn't change. Is there any response to that? Yeah, and here's a one way of thinking about design. Um, there's certainly the functions of usability, which to your point about gum hadn't changed dramatic, and, and the use shifted a little bit. The physical didn't change, but the meaning that the gum had for people did change. Now, again, that was supported both in terms of branding and advertising, but it also was linked with a physical link to the package. So you're right. While the gum didn't change, how it was perceived, especially through the packaging, and again, um, it was only recently that Wrigley was beginning to be aware that packaging determined a lot of sales as opposed to just being the flavor and consistency of the gum. So absolutely right, but we would say the design changed a lot. Great. Okay, we have another question. When you talk about culture, aren't there variations in culture based on age groups? My experience is that younger generations' culture is often an adaptation of their home country and many popular cultural aspects. How do you design products to consider these differences? That's a, that's a great question, and that's absolutely right. There are different age groups. There are different uh, regions. Um, one of the um, things that we'll talk a lot about in the class is, is the challenge where um, – Typically, when we've looked at culture, when we've thought about products and services for different countries, we've thought about a country as a single unit where everybody has the same cultural behaviors and cultural values. Um, and if you just push that a little bit, it begins to fall apart. I mean, it's true in the United States. It's true in parts of Europe. It's certainly true in China that, um, it, that you don't have the same culture across um, all demographic groups, across all regions. Um, and you know, our approach to uh, cross-cultural design is to really go in and understand um, these different groups in these um, different regions. And, and that's going to be true you know, in any kind of product design that you do. You know, you're going to have target mar markets where there are different um, different needs, different behaviors within different cultural groups. But I think it's especially true um, when you're talking about large, diverse um, cultures. Um, again, for example, China. And in China, we also see um, dramatic differences um, generationally because of the pace of change in China. Uh, historically, um, People have seen China as, for example, a very collectivist kind of culture. Uh, but one of the, the recent um, policies um, has 
really shifted that in, in very important ways. So the one-child policy in China has resulted in um, now kind of college-age uh, kids having grown up um, as a single child um, with the, the focus of uh, their parents and their grandparents, no brothers and sisters, no cousins. Um, and that's actually caused a, a shift in um, the culture toward uh, a more individualistic perspective, more like what you would see in the U.S. Um, so it's very important to attend um, to these uh, generational shifts, regional shifts, um, urban versus rural, um, because as the, the person asking the question mentioned, you know, exposure to global media makes a difference. So all of this needs to be taken into account. Great. Okay, our next question. How can you sell a product or service to a country that has little need for such an item or is really counterproductive for the global future well-being? So I think they were referring to that in the webinar that we covered that it appeared to make products with better sustainable qualities, but the discussion suggested the opposite. So how can we sell a product or a service in a country that has a little need for such an item? Okay, um, well, I, I think that the, you know, very much the position that we're taking is that you don't, um, that, that you really don't want to sell a product or service into a country where there's not a need for it. Um, and, in fact, we would argue that that's actually probably not the most productive strategy, that, in fact, what you want to do is really understand uh, these underlying needs, these, these deep needs that people have, and... Um, try to then deliver products that meet those fundamental needs. In the, in the Wrigley example, um, and you are right, were we heightening an anxiety that didn't exist before? Uh, and in one sense, we were making people more aware of breath in a way that they had. In fact, the notions of what good breath were created as these products were introduced into the market. I think there's the other side, and this has to do with cigarette smoking and rates of cancer, and we were looking at Wrigley gum as an alternative to uh, essentially what is a scourge, uh, a health scourge within China, and it's the sense of providing an alternative social lubricant to something that is just a disaster. Great. As a part of a product design project, is it important among many things to sell the idea internally that considering the cultural nuances will outweigh the costs incurred in designing for globalization? What are the tools in your arsenal that you have successfully used to address these concerns in large corporations? And also a second part of the question is, are they different in a high-tech world? Okay, so I, I understand the question to be, um, you know, if how do you um, convince your organization or your management that um, investing in um, maybe a more um, expensive and labor-intensive process of understanding the global needs is actually going to pay, uh, pay off in the long run? Um, I think one of the ways that um, I've seen uh, be very effective in organizations is through case studies. Um, actually sharing with organizations some of the ways that, um, you know, as Michael's example of Wrigley, how it actually transformed uh, their ability to participate in the market. And I think that um, numerous examples are out there of ways that organizations have done this and also ways that organizations have failed miserably and very expensively um, when they haven't done that. And um, I think that those those provide very compelling stories for management. There, there is another approach here, and it, it has to do with uh, Pam's diagram where she shows the foundational differences. And we're actually involved right now with a, uh, a, a, a very large uh, provider of operating systems and search engines. And um, they are very concerned about the idea that we should look at difference because in their minds, if we look at difference, we're going to have to change our product. 
uh, and changing our product is kind of unthinkable, especially with the idea that we kind of have an evolutionary model that our product is at the top of the evolutionary scale and everybody else is trying to basically get to where we are. Um, one, we've seen that very often, this is, by the way, very high tech, uh, the meaning around the Internet, around search, is dramatically different in different parts of the world, um, especially uh, Asia and Southeast Asia, and that uh, products that are about uh, uh, technology and the idea that we don't want to be left behind is the American view. We need to keep up. We need to stay with technology, and there's a currency in being high-tech. What we've seen in Southeast Asia, that's not necessarily the case, that the idea of the technology alone doesn't have a lot of value. What does have value is being left out. That's very different than being left behind, and that social component of high-tech is what, in fact, is most important, and how do you leverage that? Um, so back to the foundation. Uh, the anxiety is that the foundation's wrong, we have to start over, as opposed to, and this is sort of the statement of the baseball, um, there are enough similarities that what we need to help with are seeing the, the landmines, the roadblocks, and that it's important to be inclusive but in so much as like the baseball players, you can find the rules that will allow you to be successful without necessarily having to start over. And that's, we found, a very good, useful, a very, very uh, positive way of selling this idea of cultural difference uh, into companies where they're not really sure cultural difference is going to matter. Great. So that's going to conclude our question and answer portion for today. I'd definitely like to thank Michael and Pam for their taking their time out today and giving us a wonderful um, look into different ways that culture affects your product design. Um, and I look forward to actually learning more in June when the course comes to campus. Great. So this concludes today's webinar on global product design. And as a reminder, you can, may now print a PDF of the slides by selecting the Print to PDF option in the lower navigation bar. Also, remember to look for an email that will alert you when the webinar becomes available to watch a video format and also any further information. Again, thank you for joining us today, and I see that there are still a couple questions in the queue, and we will stay after and answer those via text uh, through live meeting and make sure that they're all answered. And for the rest of us, those who have had their questions answered, you are, may now disconnect. Thank you.